The book of Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> to, this morning's theme is New Year. And New Year implies a, a, a lot of things, doesn't it? New start, new beginning, uh, forget the past, let's move on, no regrets. Just so much that we can can look at as far as a new year. And for some of us, it's like, whew, we made it. Now let's approach this new year differently. Some of us might even have New Year resolutions. I stopped that a long time ago. I just never could keep them. I'd start off for a week or two and then get off the diet, <laughs> get off the, the horse, you know, in a sense, because I fell off and then just kind of get into the year again. But it is a new year, and I think that as a new year comes in, we should be reminded uh, of some basic fundamentals in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me start with just a, a, a little humorous joke. One day an angel appeared to, to Adam, and the angel said, Adam, I've got some great news for you. This is a whole new beginning for you. It, it's a new year, Adam. God is going to create something wonderful just for you. And Adam said, what is it? And the angel said, it's not an it, it's a she. God is going to make something called a woman. And Adam said, okay, go on. And the angel continued, this is going to be really wonderful for you. This woman will be made to be a lot like you physically, only much more beautiful than you. She will live to serve you all the time. Okay, now his eyes are really getting bulgy. And when you're tired, she'll give you a massage. When you are hungry, she'll feed you. She'll come and bow down to you in the morning and when you return from work and in the garden in the evening. She'll live to serve you every day and it will be a pleasure for her. In addition, the angel continued, she'll, she will never argue with you or complain about you. She won't nag you or talk back to you either. For every command you give her, she'll simply reply, yes, master. She'll even clean your house and tend to your every desire. And Adam had this sparkle in his eye and he said with excitement, wow, that sounds amazing. I'd really like to have something like that. What's it going to cost me? And the angel said, well, Adam, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. And Adam thought about it for a while, and he cried, what could I get for a rib? <laughs> and this is what we got for a rib. <laughs> Think about that for a second. <clears throat> Please don't, don't settle for less, though, in 2017. Be all that God has made you to be. Glorify him in the way that you serve uh, one another as a husband and wife, as brothers and sisters in Christ and in the ministry. This morning I have three, three very basic points that I'd like to share with you. Uh, one is, is that we will continue to just teach the word. We're just going to teach the word as we have been for 23 years now. We're, we're now 23 years uh, of serving the Lord here in this community. And so we're going to continue to teach through the word of God. It's evolving, though, as I teach, and I, I change some things, and, and I kind of like that, and then you'll probably see that more in the future. I think some of you have already noticed that the, the teaching has changed in a little bit, and that I give you some points, things to write about, and so forth. And then secondly, that we are to let the Spirit of God lead us. God has given us a spirit, and that is the Spirit of God, and He does dwell inside of us when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And by the way, that Holy Spirit is the one that illuminates the Word of God, that illuminates truth, that leads and guides us, comforts us, and teaches us all truth. But we need to be led by the Holy Spirit as we walk in this world. And then thirdly, raising up disciples. We want to raise up disciples this year, and we should every year. It's one area that I lack, and you know, I'm honest about it. I, I lack in that area because I was never really discipled. Uh, the person that discipled me was Jesus Christ. I had a personal relationship with him and everything I learned was because I got into the word, I prayed, I sought him. I, like 
Jacob wrestled with God. I wanted to know things. I wanted to experience things. And he showed me so much in my relationship. And it was all because I hungered for him more than anything else. And I was discipled by reading the word of God, by listening to radio, by finally connecting with certain people. And not necessarily them sitting down with me and discipling me, but watching them. Watching their lives, how they handle things, uh, listening to what they say when questions come up or just in even conversations, just uh, hearing them and then thinking, yeah, that sounds like something I should apply to in my life. And so I've always struggled with, with discipleship. I, I, I'm not a one-on-one -on -one or even a group person that gets together and let's all disciple one another. You know, I, I think the, God has to do a lot of that. It's a movement of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person. But, but I also know that it's something that's very needed in the church. And so I hope to do more of that. <clears throat> a new work to begin. Uh, the old work was old wineskin. And the new work was the work of the Holy Spirit in what we're going to read this morning. Jesus came, as you know, to fulfill the Old Testament law and to give us a new dispensation. And that dis dispensation or time frame is what the word dispensation means. We're in a dispensation of grace. Where as believers, as children of God, we live by grace and through grace and with grace and not under the law. The, the law is there to remind us that we can't keep it, though there are good principles to gain from the law that we should apply to our lives. But in no way do they uh, obtain salvation for us. It is literally by grace. And thus the old wineskin and the new wineskin is the wineskin of the moving of the Holy Spirit. The disciples will be introduced to the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And I, I, and I hope you get that this morning. There is an empowering of the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't matter how old you are. You can be the youngest of child or the oldest of a gentleman. The same Holy Spirit wants to enter into you and ignite you and empower you to live the Christian life. It doesn't matter what personality you have either, by the way. You have 12 disciples from all forms of life, from zealots to tax collectors to fishermen to, to you know, uh, Judas Iscariot, a thief. And, and God entered every one of them and changed them all. For his glory. So it has nothing to do with us or our flesh or our abilities or what we think are gifts, but that the Holy Spirit comes into us and empowers us to live for Christ. Let's go ahead and look at the chapter and then I will share those points with you. Um, the Lord kind of changed this, this message. I was actually studying another message, almost done with it, and then I started my devotions in the book of Acts. And as I was reading Acts chapter 1, I was just like, wow, Lord, this is, this is good. This would be great to teach on Sunday morning. And, of course, this was uh, Saturday morning when I got it, so I had to study all day Saturday. So this is definitely uh, a teaching that came about by the Spirit of God leading me to change my whole message. So what you're going to hear is from the Spirit of God. Um, I didn't have the time to study like I normally do. I just went by what the Lord was giving me, and I put it down. So understand that. And so if there are some flaws and mistakes, then you'll know why too, because it was a last-minute thing. <laughs> but anything good comes out of it is definitely God. So we have Acts chapter 1, verse 1, the former account I made, O Theopolis. Now, <clears throat> Luke is the author of the book of Acts. He is also the writer of the gospel of Luke. And so he's referring to that writing and he in a sense is continuing uh, at the end of the gospel of Luke on into the book of Acts here. So he says the former account of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So everything that Jesus did while he walked on the earth with the disciples, how he handled the religious leaders, uh, how they abused him, took him, crucified him, and how they buried him, and then how they saw the resurrected Jesus walking among the earth. So all of that, he says, all of that, both to do and what he taught until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. I thought that was so interesting 
that here is Jesus who is teaching and living the life as an example for the disciples, primarily them. He's really pouring into them and, and knowing that later on they would pour into others. But it says, he through the Holy Spirit, Jesus through the Holy Spirit was giving the disciples these doctrines, these teachings, these commandments and statutes. It was through the Holy Spirit moving in the life of Jesus Christ. Not that Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to be saved or to become God or anything like that, but the Holy Spirit was active in the life of Jesus Christ also. And it was the Holy Spirit that was bringing these commandments to Jesus in that triunity, that union that they have the father son and holy spirit working together to get the gospel message out and the book of acts really is the acts of the holy spirit in the life of the believer really is and so if the holy spirit is working working actively in the life of jesus christ then he has to work actively in our life if we are to teach our children to teach our Sunday schools, to teach from the pulpit, then we need to depend upon the active work of the Holy Spirit to bring to remembrance the truths and to make sure that those truths that we are teaching and sharing are within the context of the gospel message and what the apostles had wrote. And so not only did the Holy Spirit give these commands, but he was instrumental in choosing the disciples, as it says there, he chose as he chose, verse 3, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So the evidence of Jesus' resurrected body was, was shown to many for 40 days. Not just was he seen, because that would be one point of evidence right you see someone oh i i I saw them okay but was it a ghost but i saw them okay but maybe you were imagining not only is was that an evidence but he actually walked in here and then he communicated with us another form of evidence but we all met had a mass hallucinative you know situation but then some of us touched him literally shook his hand or hugged him and maybe even some of us sat and ate with him, which is totally different. So, so many, many fall, infallible proofs that Jesus resurrected. <clears throat> and the evidence was clearly there as many saw them. And he was speaking the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And of course, he continued on, right? Even after the resurrection to, to share the things that are important for the kingdom of God, the teaching, the doctrines of God. How do we know God? How do we know that this is true? How do we know that someone else's God is not the God of the Bible? How do we know that we only have the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can get to the Father except through Christianity? How do we know all those things? And those are good questions to ask. I think they're honest questions. I asked them all when I first got saved. How do I really know I'm in the right faith and the right belief? I came out of Catholicism my whole life. And then I get introduced to Jesus and I become born again and I begin to research and study and and get to know him and my life is changing miracles upon miracles and, and just the Holy Spirit moving in my life. And there was a time when the boys, I believe, uh, and myself uh, were going to get baptized. In fact, I think it was uh, Richard who baptized Virginia um, we've got a picture of him baptizing Virginia. And I remember thinking when the boys got baptized, are we in the right religion? You know, have I made a mistake? Because now I'm baptizing them in this faith and, and basically saying I denounce that one. And for that split second or minute, I'm thinking, what if I made a mistake? <laughs> what if I did the wrong thing? I mean, that's real when when you're thinking about these things and they impact you. And I had to get back to the word and and, and read it and study it and and say, but your word is so clear and, and what they teach is so evidently wrong. And so I've got to trust your word. I've got to trust your word. 
And it starts there with you believing that this is the word of God. And I encourage you to to study that, to go to the library, find books, study the word. Try to find an heir. Someone may have told you, well, there's heirs in the Bible. Okay, well, show me that heir. And then look at it and you decide for yourself if that's an heir or not. And I'll tell you, there are no heirs in the Bible because I went through that phase. And usually when someone says, oh, there's heirs all over the place, it's because they're just repeating what someone else told them. They haven't really done any research. Well, then show it to me. I want to see it. You can't because there is none. There is none. So the word of God is so important and it is vital to the Calvary Chapel movement. It it, it is one of the foundational principles of Calvary Chapel. It's what separates Calvary from all the other churches that are out there. We emphasize God's word above anything else. We really do. Try other churches. Visit other churches and you'll see the difference in, in, in the teaching style. And you have many different teaching styles. What we believe in expositional teaching is going through the word of God from Genesis to Revelation, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and expounding within the context of that text where there are so many others who just do topicals. Well, let's do a topical today, and this topical today will be on money. And it seems like that's one of the major topics that you'll have in a lot of churches. Or this one will be on family. Or this one will be on being single. Or this, you know, and they're topics. But you're never getting the whole counsel of God. What you're getting is his counsel because he's chosen to do a topic on this. Where I really don't choose the text. I just go through the Bible. That's why we're in Genesis on Wednesday night. 35 chapters now we've gone through. And we'll just continue to go through, let God pick the text, I study the text, and I present the text to you. That's what Calvary Chapel believes. The Calvary Chapel family of pastors, reading and teaching the Bible is so important. And we try to convey that to those that come to this church or any Calvary Chapel church, is that you too should be in the Word of God. And what I find interesting, even within the Calvary Chapel movement, is that a lot of people are not in the Word of God. It's difficult to be in the Word of God because you have the enemy attacking you, just the flesh, and it does take time. But every morning, you should get up in the morning and you should open up your Word, you should pick a book, and you should read through that book. Even if it's a few verses, do a little bit of highlighting, but at least get into it and learn to do it. It's a practice. It's a commitment, and you don't stop, even if you don't get anything out of it right away. When I first got saved and I started reading the Bible, the Lord just was ministering to me a lot, but there were things I didn't understand, but I didn't stop to try to understand them. I just wanted to get through, and so I just kept reading. And then when I went through it again the second time and I came across those same passages that I didn't understand, all of a sudden it was like, I understand that now. Why is that? Because now I have everything else that I've read, and now it makes sense. I was just telling somebody uh, last, I think Wednesday night when we were teaching 35 of Genesis, I've been really loving the devotions that we do here on Wednesday, on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. I don't study for them. We just, we're just going through the New Testament, going through a chapter every, every morning. I encourage you to to, uh, look us up on Facebook and you can um, view the devotion because we put it on Facebook live. And so it's recorded and you can see it later on if you can't make it at nine o'clock. And people are watching it from from Texas to Oklahoma, even Africa. Yeah. And so it's more of a a devotional that I let the Spirit of God move in in that teaching. And so it's interesting because I'll I'll read it before I I, I present it in our devotions. And it's like the Lord just showing me things there. And it's, it's not necessarily that they're new revelations, but that I understand it. It's like, wow, I get this, Lord. Oh, now that it makes sense even more than when I, you know, taught it before. Like Genesis, I haven't taught, um, what, 14 years ago, I think it was, that I went through the book of Genesis. And now I'm going through it again, the second time teaching it. Been through it many times reading, but just teaching it. And so when you read it and you study it, it becomes a part of you. But you've got to read it. It's not the only thing that we do, though as Calvary Chapel, but it is the essential thing. There's so much more to a church than just going through the word of God, but it's definitely one of the main things. 
By our, by our understanding of God's word, we know how we should do all other things. That is so true. When you understand God's word, then you understand how to do everything else that pertains to life. Well, how do we treat one another? We're going to read the word of God. How do we respect one another? Read the word of God. Well, how do I deal in this situation? Read the word of God. How do I take care of my financial? Read the word of God. It's all in there if we just read it. We know the importance of practicing, of worship, prayer, community, evangelism, but it's all because of the word of God that we know the importance of those things. This is something deep in our character as Calvary Chapel, pastors especially, going back to when Chuck would simply teach through the word of God. He emphasized the verse-by-verse examination and explanation of the Bible, and he did a great job at it. He practiced and promoted what is called expositional teaching or preaching, which works to, to draw the meaning and the emphasis of the teaching from the Bible itself, hoping to let us let the scriptures speak for themselves. And that is what's so important, is just let the Bible say what the Bible has to say, and we have to agree with it and believe it. And that's what makes Christianity really so simple, but yet so profound. And we fight against it because we are flesh, and we are set in our ways. We have uh, a certain perspective of how things should be, when in reality, they, they really may not have to be. You know, I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago about traditions, right? Or was it on a Sunday? The tradition of prayer, and we close our eyes. Nowhere in the Bible do you find the closing of the eyes in prayer, right? Yet we all do it. And what if all of a sudden I said, hey, let's just keep our eyes open and I'll pray. Wouldn't you feel uncomfortable looking at me? Some of you would probably feel that. It's because it's such a, it's been embedded in us. But yet we should be able to do that with grace and, and understand that God accepts the prayer just as much as if your eyes were closed. And so the same is true of us removing some of the fleshly things that we believe because we've learned them from our parents, from our friends, from what we watch on TV, what we've read in books, and we think they're the the truth. They're the truth. Uh, We went and saw uh, the movie yesterday, Fence, with Denzel Washington, and it is a story about the the African-American living during the 1920s, 1930s. Don't go see it. It is a depressing movie. Uh, but if you like movies like that, that portray uh, uh, the reality of, of the struggles of life, because it portrayed the struggle of, of the African-American trying to make it in America. It was just hardcore life. Uh, uh, having a wife and having a mistress and having a father who just fathered, you know, several, several kids. Uh, you're, you're weeping through the whole movie. I mean, I was just touched deeply. Oh, they believe in God, and God was put in there, and their faith, and the church, and praying over the whole, you know, just a, a really depressing movie, but yet life situation, life. And, and I was crying, I was weeping. I can remember my dad never being around, always being gone. And then I have a stepbrother finding out later on, and all the drama, and and real stuff that happens to real people. And it's devastating for some of us. And some of us get stuck there. We get hooked in and we can't get ourselves out of that mentality and that thinking. And as I was watching this, I'm thinking, but Lord, you're not this way. Yeah, life is hard. And, and life was hard for a group of people, especially the African-Americans and, and how they were brought here. But the, it was also hard for the Hispanic people and for the Italian people and for the Irish people. It's hard for everybody because we're all humans. We're all selfish. And we have to deal with life struggles and uh, understanding one another and so forth. And I thought, Lord, I thank God that I have this word because I really know how I ought to act, and how I ought to believe and think. I shouldn't think that the world owes me anything. You know, like in this movie, it's, it's the white man, you know, and that you have to not plead, but you work and you work and you work and you show them that you're better, than, you know, this kind of mentality. When the Bible tells, just humble yourself and I'll lift you up. Just humble yourself and I'll lift you up. It's the word of God 
that changes our lives. And it's one that should be emphasized within any church. Let's look at verse 4. So the word of God, point one. The Holy Spirit is promised here. Look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Again, the Holy Spirit. Don't just wait in Jerusalem. Jesus is going to ascend unto the Father. I want you to go wait, and I want you to go in the upper room, and I want you to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when they came, or when they had come together, verse 6, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Look, disciples, don't get off track. I know you want to know the information You want to know the whys and the becauses, but just go to the room and wait for the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, you're going to be witnesses. Forget about all of that. And sometimes we are so, as a church, why is this happening? How come they do this and do that? You know, stop it. Just just be filled with the Spirit and fulfill your ministry. Just, Just stay busy with God's kingdom, with what he's given you as a responsibility, and stop worrying about other things and other plausibilities and so forth, because all those things just get you sidetracked from what God is doing in your life. Just go to the upper room. Just wait there. But we've got questions. Aren't you going to restore the kingdom? No. Don't worry about it. My father knows that. If he wants to tell you, he'll tell you. Just go and wait and stop asking. Now, when he had spoken, verse 9, these things, while they watched, he was taken up, that is, Jesus, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. They got to experience the ascension of Jesus Christ. And they watched it, and they were amazed by it. But the angel said, hey, why are you gazing? He gave you the command to go wait in Jerusalem. So then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room. So there's the upper room situation. John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all talk about the upper room scenario. Read it. It is an amazing group of chapters together that will give you insight to Jesus and to the Father and to the disciples. It is a close, deep, intimate time that they spend with one another. It is, it is a great read there. They're to go to that upper room and they're to wait. They were to stay, and so they were. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, Alphaeus, son of uh, Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James, all these continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So they went up and they waited and they were in prayer. They were in supplication with the women and I believe probably some children and some brothers that were there, um, a part of the group too. And they waited on the Lord in prayer. What were they waiting for? the Holy Spirit. And what were they expecting? I don't think they knew what they were expecting, but the Holy Spirit would lead them and guide them as they were filled with the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. As Calvary Chapel, we believe that there is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit plays a very big part in the work of the ministry. Without the Holy Spirit, we really are spinning our wheels like that little mouse in the cage that just runs around, not going anywhere, but just spinning that little wheel, doing nothing, and then going and eating and coming back and doing the same thing. We need the moving of the Holy Spirit to actually get something fruitful done. You know, you can work and work and work, and it's not fruitful. And there's a time where you have to say, 
maybe it's not <laughs> what God wants us to do. Maybe God isn't even in it. Maybe this is something we just kind of want to do. And we need to just stop. We need to ask, Lord, are you in this? Uh, Chuck used to teach very clearly that if you ever want to support something, support something that you see the Holy Spirit working in. And if you see the Holy Spirit working in something, you'll see fruit. You'll see growth. You'll see not just number growth, but spiritual growth too. You'll see people, men and women, coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but also having an intimate relationship with Jesus. Their lives changing before your very eyes. That's what you want to invest in. That's what you want to invest in. We believe the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son to convict the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. <clears throat> and it's only through the Holy Spirit that, we'll, that He will open up our eyes to understand the truth. I can't do that for the longest time. I used to believe that I could just come up to someone and they would accept the Lord. I, I thought I just had the knowledge of the word and I can convict them of their sins and so forth and they would come to know Jesus Christ. And a lot of times they would, but it wasn't lasting because it was me convincing them that they needed Jesus. It has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. And so now I kind of view it a little differently. I, I don't put all of my, my strength and my will into it, I just trust that God is going to do what he wants to do. Remember what we read earlier? Through the Holy Spirit, Jesus was giving them commandments and he gave them, he gave Jesus the understanding of who to be chosen. God chose them, God chose them. I don't cho choose them, I can't choose someone. I can't come up and say, oh, you should be saved, I'm gonna save you right now. Hang on, and no, God has to save you. Otherwise, it's not true salvation. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person that opens up their eyes to the understanding, convicts them of their sins and their need for Jesus Christ, and it's real to them. It is real that they want nothing else but Jesus Christ. But so many people come to the Lord because of what someone said, and their relationship based, is based upon what that person said. Well, I came to the Lord because so-and-so just convict me, uh, of my sins he pressured me I felt like he, he wouldn't leave me alone until I finally said the sinner's prayer and so I'm in church because of them and you know well then you're not saved <laughs> you're not knowing the Lord in the right way you need to forget that and you need to just come to Jesus Christ and him alone and not for any other reason of a person or a place or a thing but because you want to know Jesus Christ and that's what I hope that you'll get from this we believe that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are available to the church, and that the Holy Spirit has a position, a distinct position concerning the moving of that church. We believe there is an experience of an empowering of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer that is distinct and separate from the indwelling spirit that takes place in conversion. And I think we see that in the book of Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit fell upon them, upon them, it's, it's a move of the Holy Spirit. When you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in you. Some believe that the Holy Spirit is in everyone already, and that's why uh, when we do bad things, whether we know the Lord or not, we feel bad about it because it's the Holy Spirit convicting us of our sins. I don't necessarily believe or agree with that. I think the Holy Spirit is around us and that he has given us an understanding of right and wrong so that we can use that hopefully, to make a decision for Jesus Christ. But when we do humble ourselves and surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in us. But that's one filling. There is another filling. There's an empowering. And as Calvary Chapel, we believe that the Holy Spirit can come upon you and empower you to live the Christian life. And there are a lot of Christians who are not filled. I think that this is a generation, and some of us that have been around like during the early Calvary Chapel movement, and a little shortly after, it seems like this is the generation where the Spirit is being left out. There's not an empowering of the Holy Spirit to live that life. And so what we're seeing is churches with all the lights, with all the drama, with all the technology and entertainment just to keep people to stay. That's not, a, that's not the move of the Holy Spirit. When it's the Holy Spirit, Man, we don't care if it's in South Africa in a little hut and there's dirt. We're going to come and hear the word. We don't care if it's 
a, a church like this that's not really fancy and all of that stuff. We want to just come hear the word. We want to fellowship. We want to just keep, with, keep within the doctrine of what God has shared with us. And it's not the lighting. It's not the campus atmosphere of Disneyland, you know, that keeps people. But it is a born-again, Holy Spirit-filled life. It's an empowering and then that empowering, that coming upon, et, which is para en or epe, which comes upon you and fills you to live that life. That is what we want as God leads us and guides us through this world. The church cannot live without it. It's going to die eventually. Look at verse 15. So we need teaching and we need the Holy Spirit to illuminate it, to lead us and to guide us into the new year. And verse 15 says, and in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Uh, altogether, the number of names was about 120. So we're right there, 120 people. That's their church. That's the early church. That's how many started in the early church. And they said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Oof. I, I highlighted that because how sad. He's talking about Judas Iscariot here, right? He was the one that betrayed Jesus. And notice that Luke says that he was numbered with us. We're numbered with one another right here. And there are many others that are numbered with us that aren't here right now. They're, they're gone because of the holiday season. You know, they're out visiting friends and families, but they're numbered with us. That's what he's talking about. They're numbered with us. And there are others that have been numbered with us that haven't been fellowshipping with us as they should be, but they're a part of the church. And then there are numbers who are part of us and have fellowship with us, but they're no longer of us because they've left this church. I'm not saying they left God, but they left this church. Judas was numbered among them and obtained a part in the ministry. He was a part of the ministry. A little different now. A lot of us are numbered, but not all of us are a part. Not all of us are serving, helping. Judas was helping and serving. He was a treasurer. He was a treasurer. He went out preaching the gospel message with the disciples seeing miracles and signs and wonders and, and even healings and people being exercised of demons. He saw all those things. But yet, yet it says that he was not of them. That, I think, is scary for so many of us. Just because you're numbered and even apart Make sure that you're filled with the Holy Spirit and doing it for the right reasons. You know, times like this, as, as we went back to one service, it's, it's going to be a challenge for us, and it's going to be a challenge for those that aren't connected really to the church. Because you always have those. You always have people that are numbered with the church, but they're not connected. They're not a part. And, and eventually they'll leave. And that, that it, it, for all kinds of reasons. In fact, sometimes they'll look for reasons because they just don't want to really be there. And that's okay. I mean, that's fine. You know, uh, I hope that they'll find a church and, and they'll get connected there. Um, but it will be a challenge because it will be a challenge for those that are connected. So why am I here? Are we taking a step back? Some may think that. Or maybe it's a cleansing. We can think of that. It's a weeding out of those that aren't really connected. Because if you're not really connected, you don't want to be here, and I don't want you to be here and be miserable. You need to move on. It's time for you to go. Find another place. This isn't my place. This is God's place. This is where Jesus dwells, and he has equipped us with various gifts of the ministry, and we are just to use those gifts. As soon as we're all gone from this church, guess what? This building's empty. It's not the church. We're the church. We're the church. And, and so I say all that to say this. I'm being sincere. This isn't about building a kingdom or building my wallet. This is about building God's kingdom and teaching his truth. 
And, it, and if you don't want to be here, then don't be here. Please go somewhere else and find a place. I hope you'll go to church, though. But let me say this. If you leave and you're not going to church, then the issue is with you. And it's not with the church. I'm human just like you are. You know, I, I've heard people say, well, he didn't come visit me. Well, wasn't the last time you come and visit me? He didn't say good morning. I, a few people here said good morning to me this morning. A lot of you didn't say good morning. You don't want me to have a good morning or what? <laughs> you can get into those things, right? But I'm human just like you are, man. <clears throat> he didn't come see me in the hospital. Yeah, I didn't. You know, I, I have this thought that, you know, you call me, you're in the hospital, okay, I'll give you a day. Because so many times, you know, I'm trying to study, I got all these other things going, I take off to the hospital, it's where so-and-so, oh, they just checked them out. I'm like, okay, they didn't call me. It'd be nice if they didn't call, I'm not there no more, don't come. So I wait a day, make sure they're checked in and everything's fine, and then I go, you know. Or they moved them. I've had that done too. Where they, ah, they're over here. So I drive all the way up to Highland and San Bernardino and I get there. Oh, they just moved them this morning. They're now over here. I'm like, oh, okay. Never. So, and I'm not saying those are excuses. I'm just saying I'm human like you and things happen. Doesn't mean I'm going to stop. It's going to be a missing, missing hit. And I have learned too that I can pour everything into someone and then one little thing that I say or do, and they're gone. I'm out of here. You're on loving, caring. You know, so what do I have to do? I have to do what you do. You have to focus on you and God and your family because you are men and women, and you have your family. You have responsibility, you know, and you should be taking care of one another too. We, we've seen that on a, on a Wednesday night or actually during our devotions. We're learning a lot through our devotions. Timothy or Titus talking about widows and how families should be taking care of the widows, not the church. I'm a widow here. You need to take care of me. Do you have children? Yes. Go to your children because the Bible says the children are to take care of the widows first. Don't come to, oh, what kind of loving church are you? We're not. We're a biblical church. And the truth is, is that your family should take care of you first. Now, if you have no family, then come and we're going to help you out as much as we can. And in fact, you need to be in the church more often because you now have the time and opportunity, not having any other responsibilities, even if it's just for praying and being a part of it. That's biblical. Read, read the uh, pastoral epistles. But we make the excuses. Well, they're unloving. But you have family. They should take the responsibility to do that, to visit you and, and so forth. You... <sighs> Judas was numbered, he took a part, but yet he still wasn't really a part of the work of God. And, and this is going to take self-confrontation for us to really look at, at ourselves. What we need to do is raise up disciples. I'm going to close here. Raise up disciples. <clears throat> How do we raise up disciples? Well, you can't disciple an unbeliever. You can't. And if somebody doesn't want to get discipled, you can't disciple them. <clears throat> First, we need to find men that are filled with the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 6. They needed somebody to help, and so let's go out and find men filled with the Holy Spirit to take care of tables and distributing food and, and so forth. But they had to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The same filling of the Holy Spirit that the disciples were filled to teach the Word of God. The same Spirit of God. The disciples, it doesn't say sat down with them. This is how you're going to serve tables. Let's go through a book here on 10 good ways to serve tables, and I'll disciple you on how to serve tables. They didn't do that. Just get men filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit will lead them as they serve tables because they're going to love it and enjoy it. The book of Acts is the acts of the Holy Spirit working in the life of the believer. Jesus did not say to make converts to your way of thinking, but he said to look after his sheep to see that they get nourished in the knowledge of who he is. We are not to disciple people to be like us. We're to disciple people to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. Discipleship is based solely on our devotion to Jesus Christ. We're all different, and I totally agree with that. I don't want you to be like me. I have too many flaws. I want you to be like Jesus. 
And then I want you to take the gifts that he's given you and use them for his glory. I'm, I am pretty simple as far as leadership. Uh, again, and it, it could be because I didn't have great discipleship. You know, my pastor didn't sit down and say, okay, we're going to go through discipleship class and books and read. And I, I just was led by the Spirit and I did it. That's how I learned. So I, I kind of, I may feel like you should be able to do the same thing, you know, and maybe that's a, an area that I have to work on. And I, I understand that. <clears throat> maybe I need to sit down more with, with people. But when you're devoted to Jesus, I think he'll begin to lead you and, and guide you to serve. It's based upon your devotion to Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and oftentimes, uh, and I love, com communication definitely is one that's needed within the ministries, definitely. Just what's going on, because, because you all ask me about the children's ministry, and I have no idea what's going on in the children's ministry. You ask me what's going on with the youth, I'm like, I don't know. You know, I got a call the other day. Hey, uh, they're having the white elephant gift of the youth. I'm like, really? They are? Oh, I didn't know about it. Do you know what time? I'm like, no, I don't. Here's Roman's number. Give him a call. So communication is good, so at least I know what's going on. But as far as what's going on, man, I leave that to you and the Lord, and I figure God will lead you to do whatever he wants you to do in that ministry. I, I, I'm a hands-off person. I don't really like to force my the way that I do it. Now you ask me how to do it, then I'm going to tell you. This is what I would do, but if the Spirit is leading you, He'll lead you. And that's, I think, good discipleship too, where I'm not making you just like me. If anyone comes to me, Jesus said, and does not hate, he cannot be my disciple. In this verse, there is a argument and no pressure from Jesus to follow him, but he is simply saying, in effect, if you want to be my disciple, you must devote yourself solely to me. You have to be devoted to me. A person touched by the Spirit of God suddenly says, now I see Jesus, I get it, and I want more of it, and I want to serve him. And as I serve him, he'll lead me and guide me and teach me. Sometimes in our service, we get overzealous, and we step on other people's toes. And then other people say things and we're like, oh, I, I messed up. No, you're learning. Don't do that next time. That's how the Lord disciples us. The secret of discipleship, of a discipleship life is devotion to Christ. And the characteristic of that life is one of service. It really is. You cannot be discipled unless you're serving. If you want to just sit with me to talk and fellowship, that's one thing. But, but if you want to sit and be discipled, then that would be service. And I'm going to point you where I was pointed by Pastor Chuck and Calvary Ministry. Take a broom and go sweep outside and start learning what it is to serve. You're not going to like it. You're, you're going to get upset at times, but the toilets have to be cleaned. You'll have to start there <clears throat> and learn to be a servant. <clears throat> the fact that Chuck even... The week be I remember seeing him like a couple of weeks or that conference before he passed away. He was in that golf cart and he adjusts him, adjusts himself. He had one of those stickies with the little handle, the little claw, and he's driving around picking up papers. You know, once in a while he's reaching over. I could see him reaching over and trying to pick up bear with his hands, but he's because he's a servant first. And that's the example that I saw. I saw that through Romaine. He was there to serve Pastor Chuck. <clears throat> Pastor Chuck comes first. I remember one so clearly where Romaine said, I, uh, uh, Pastor Chuck came up to me and said, Romaine, it was hot up there. He said, and I began to explain myself to Pastor Chuck what happened and blah, 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 and where so-and-so was and this and that. And he said, and Pastor Chuck looks at me and says, Romaine, I didn't ask for explanation. I just said, it's hot up there. All you had to do was say, we'll get it cool next time. That was it. I'm like, wow. Wow. That's communication. That's, that's caring for one another. You know, excuses and all of that stuff. I don't really care about that. Let's just correct it. Let's get it done next time. That's the issue, right? Because we're all flawed. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all not going to do it the right way or the same way either what what color are we going to paint the inside of the sanctuary i'm not going to even open up that can of worms <laughs> you know all of those things but see all of those things together by the way whether you like it or not makes disciples of jesus christ 
because iron sharpens iron. We're going to rub each other the wrong way. We're going to learn to give and take. We're going to learn to humble ourselves. We're going to learn to cry because we didn't get our way. We're even going to back off and not come to church for a while, but then hopefully you'll come back because our arms are always open to all of God's children. <clears throat> so I'm looking forward to 2017 because there are things that are going to change, but there are things that will never change. Suffering and trials will never change. They're coming no matter what. It may change the persons that will experience them, but it's coming. And we have to endure those things and grow and trust and have faith in Jesus Christ. The things that never change is God is good. And God will never leave us or forsake us. That he'll get us through. That he'll be there for us. And that if we truly are a Holy Spirit filled church, we'll be there for one another too to encourage and strengthen one another in those times of needs. So I'm looking forward to 2017. Actually, I'm looking at 2017, even with us going back to one service, I'm looking at it as a fresh start, a new start for us to take the opportunity to get connected with a lot of you. Because <clears throat> a lot of you here have been here for a while. We have some new, a few new people here, but we want to continue to do that and, and get deeper in it. You know, some of you probably don't even know this, but Years ago, we used to have a, a once a month prayer in someone's home and they had a big enough home where we could all just meet there and we would either bring, bring in uh, some food and everyone would eat afterwards. And just for an hour, we'd all sit down and pray. And I miss those times because those times you get really connected. And Virginia has been working on <clears throat> putting an addition to our house and you'll see it in, in June when we have our baptism. And it's a pretty big room. It's probably as big as this this room here, would you say, Modesto? Yeah, maybe about as big as this room here. So we can pack in a pretty good prayer group and then afterwards have dinner. And that's what I'm looking forward to in using that room, fellowshipping and getting connected there, coming over to my house and just sitting down. We'll pray and we'll eat and we'll just get connected. And I loved that part of ministry when we used to do it. Then I got hurt and then it was just downhill from there. But God is a God of new beginnings and fresh starts. And I hope that, um, that you'll have a fresh start in 2017 also. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to read it and study it and make it a part of our lives, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit and empower us to live that life that you have called us to live, Father. And Lord, that you would make us disciples, whether it is by just the natural process of working and serving with one another, or whether it's connecting through the women's ministries, through the men's ministries, through the outreaches, Lord, or whether it's one-on-one -on -one with the pastors, Lord. Father, we pray that you would make us all devoted more deeply to Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.